G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy. So for those unaware, every now and then I do this series where you guys submit your unpopular AFL opinions and I discuss them in a video. And today's video is trade period centric. So a lot of the stuff around free agency, father sons, the academies, draft, um, and some takes on trades getting done. We're gonna focus on all of that in this video. So we got about 85 submissions and that's probably more than double what I can realistically cram into one video. So I've had to be pretty selective here, but we got a broad range of submissions. So thank you so much, let's get into it. So we're gonna cut straight to the chase and unpack probably the biggest area of discussion in this video and that's free agency. So we've got a number of uh, comments on that and we'll start with Spin Doctor. Free agency compensation should be scrapped or at the very least the team that gets the free agent should be the ones to pay any compensation. This year the Hawks get Josh Battle, they are happy. The Saints get pick eight, they are probably pretty satisfied and every other club pays the price. This repeated a few times plus Academy, Father Son, North Charity picks and suddenly Richmond's second pick that should be a natural 19 is now 26 or more. The whole point of the draft in the first place was equalization. The result of this is the antithesis of equalization. I'm sure a point system isn't beyond the AFL where the receiver of the free agent has to pay 2000 points of draft capital for band one, 1300 for band two. It is just staggering that all other teams pay the price. We might see a second round pick in the 50s this year. Cool, so big comment to start with, and um, you know this is echoed throughout the video as well around free agency compensation. So to unpack it a little bit, you make a great point about it penalizing every other team, whereas the two teams that you know, engage in the deal, in, in the example of Josh Battle, are both probably pretty happy. And it does produce some absurd results where you know, Josh Battle probably wouldn't have been traded for Pig 8. Like, uh, it obviously depends which team is going for him in a trade scenario, but Pig 8 for Josh Battle would probably exceed his actual value here. And Hawthorne, you know, it doesn't actually cost them anything other than salary cap. So we're getting this bizarre result, as you point out, of those two teams being happy and everyone else, um, you know, shuffling down a spot. Now, in isolation, that's just one spot, but obviously we've seen we've seen six free agency deals and, and three of them so far have been banned one or two, which pushes down a lot of those teams in the first couple of rounds. As you point out, Academy, Father, Son also have their, their impact plus priority picks. Well, I would actually just point out here, on the point of North Charity picks, which do not apply this year, I mean, technically they're still in the draft because they were future picks and they belong to Sydney and Gold Coast. But I actually think, Matt, is this an argument for priority picks probably being needed? If we're talking about a scenario where it's harder than ever for poor teams to replenish through the draft because they're so compromised, you point out Richmond at pick 26 here or whatever it's going to be, West Coast as well were diabolical last year and they obviously got pick one, but their second round, their, their next selection was pick 30 and that in theory should be pick 19, right? So by that logic, is there a greater need than ever for those teams that are struggling? In, if we're seeking out um, equalization here, if that's the goal, then I think the case for priority picks probably just got a little bit stronger. The thing is around like Academy and Father's Son, I think putting aside father son, we'll talk about that later in this video, but I just can't help but feel the the draft system is becoming increasingly bastardized to some extent. And I do wonder, you know, with this greater incentive for clubs to invest in their academies, which is probably a net positive for the AFL, more talent, better talent, better product. Are we heading towards a future where everyone's just more concerned about their academies and the, and the, the open pool of talent actually becomes less relevant as the main way to build your list. Now with the no restrictions on matching academy bids from the uh, NGA specifically, clubs are just gonna be completely incentivized to invest in their academies. Now this system also has limitations too, sure. You, you probably get more players you know, drafted locally and those players will be better and that's, that's a good result. But on the other hand, it then becomes extremely important. What is the catchment area? What is the talent like in each of those different catchment areas? And I, I think of the waffle where I support the Perth Demons and I don't think they've, I think they've played in one final series since I've been born just about. And I don't pretend to know a lot about the waffle and how, you know, the teams compete in that. But, you know, I, I, you'd have to think that the, the size of the catchment area of talent, there's just not a lot of players coming out of where Perth recruit from. So this logic applies as well. And I'm going on a tangent here. I will get back to the free agency stuff, but I think that could be problematic as well if, you know, certain teams have better catchment areas than others. Now on free agency specifically, um, you know, what I'll do is I'll work through some more comments and then I'll, I'll give my answer on free agency. Gbags98 says, compensation picks need to be re revamped dramatically. Pick eight for Josh Battle seems almost criminal and pick 16 for Perryman also seems overs to me. 
Marcelo says pick eight for Josh Battle is fair. It's fair in line with the rules, but pick eight for Josh Battle, in my personal opinion, you know, if this was just a normal trade, I think people would raise their eyebrows if Hawthorne had traded pick eight for Josh Battle, who is a good player, don't get me wrong, but I don't think it's quite on the money. Jaden says, free agency compensation needs a complete overhaul. Hawks got pick 19 as Lance Franklin compensation for pretty much a 10 year, 10 million contract. D's got pick three for James Frawley in the same free agency period. Sums up how the system needs a change, and that was 10 years ago. Yeah, so in terms of fairness, you're right. Um, Hawthorne don't get anywhere near as much as Melbourne. However, that exists in principle because it's there to protect the bottom teams losing their best players to the top teams. So sure, Hawthorne did lose Lance Franklin and didn't get as much as Melbourne did, but Hawthorne won the next two premierships, which reflects their reduced need for protection, whereas Melbourne, oh, I forget exactly what year that happened, but I reckon it took Melbourne a little while to become good again. I'm going to take a punt. Was that Andrew or Angus Brayshaw, sorry, that that pick resulted in? I'm not sure off the top of my head. So personally, like that particular example of Hawthorne, I don't think free agency was ever designed to make sure clubs got exactly perfect value. It's fine if the good teams cop a little bit of a loss for losing their best player in theory. It does produce some absurd results. So for instance, Ben Mackay last year, the fact that that got banned one compensation and North Melbourne took pick three to the draft. Sure, the logic still applies with them being obviously a poor team and, and therefore more reliant on their best players. But the absurd result is, first of all, Ben Mackay would never fetch pick three in an actual trade, but it disincentivized North Melbourne to match a bid and therefore force a trade because Essendon wouldn't have been able to trade anything nearly as good as pick three. So I agree it produces absurd results and, and it probably does need a revamp, but we'll keep going through comments. Morstrom says, free agency as a whole should be reworked. The compensation isn't the problem. The problem is other clubs' ability to offer players way more than they're worth. Clubs can't keep players if there are other clubs offering multiple hundreds of thousands more than they're worth just because they don't have to pay any picks for them. They should bin the free agency system as a whole and make uh, teams either trade for them or walk them to the draft. So I do agree with this. So to clarify my position, I suppose, I'm not against compensation because I think it's absurd the idea that a club can lose a player that they've had on the list for eight or 10 years for nothing. So if a club didn't get compensated at all, I think you would reach some howler outcomes where, you know, last year, okay, Ben Mackay wasn't worth pick three, but is it fair that North Melbourne get nothing for him? I just don't like the league being set up like that because he joined a stronger team and the weaker team just gets shafted in that instance. However, I also agree that the compensation is producing absurd results and compromising the draft, which is becoming increasingly bastardized, as I said. So what's the solution? Well, my personal take, I agree with you more from, I think the competition works so much better when clubs were forced to trade for every single player. That is the best way of achieving some level of equalization in this competition. Now, why won't that ever happen? Well, because the Players Association are the ones that lobbied for greater freedom of player movement. Free agency for them has made it easier for them to switch clubs. It's also made some outstanding paydays. Some of these players are getting paid way more than they're worth for the reasons that you just outlined. And the flow of the competition right now, where the game's going, the players are having more and more power. So is it likely the AFL is going to say, no, let's, let's scrap free agency? I don't think they're going to have the balls to do that. I don't know if they have the power to do that. I don't really know how all that stuff works, but I think it's just going to get easier for players and, and more beneficial for players. But I agree in an ideal scenario, clubs would need to trade for every player leaving their list. And, you know, I think the AFL should open up opportunities for what they can trade. So at the moment, you can trade this year's picks and next year's, and they're saying by next year, you'll be able to trade another year into the future. Well, if you open it up that far, then in theory, any trade can possibly be done. And, and if a club can't achieve all its trade targets in one off-season, well, that is the nature of equalization. You can't have one club trading for all players. LD Sports says free agency should be removed altogether. It hasn't achieved what it set out to do, which was get star players to lower rank clubs. Clubs, in fact, it's done the opposite. Real Swift says West Coast, Adelaide, or North will make a grand final before the decade is done. Each of these teams are starting to attract elite talent and have drafted reasonably well since 2020. West Coast in particular don't stay down for long they are, and are too massive a club to stay down. There's a second point about free agency, but I hope you're right. I hope you're right. I do, I do broadly agree. I've been somewhat quietly confident that we'll get back there some way. It does feel like a long way away right now, though. Real Swift goes on to say, also, a player should be a restricted free agent at the end of their contract, regardless if they've been at the club eight years or not, i.e. someone like Liam Baker should be able to walk to West Coast if he likes 
but Richmond should be still allowed to match a bid for them if they want. Okay, so this is actually the opposite view. This is probably creating more free agency moves. Personally, I'd be against more free agency moves. So to be clear, Liam Baker is not a free agent for anyone who's unaware. He spent seven years at Richmond, which means the trade has to be done. Well, I think it's fair if all players are held to that standard. It should just be trades, to be honest. We've got a point about mid-season trades here from Samantha Jane. She says, no idea if this counts as an unpopular opinion, but I am opposed to a mid-season trade period. I just feel it would become just another mechanism for predominantly Victorian clubs to facil facilitate player movement throughout their respective clubs while largely shutting out interstate clubs from conversations with talent. I feel this is already somewhat demonstrated by draftees declaring they won't or don't want to play for interstate clubs and declaring their desires to remain in Victoria. Given the concentration of teams in that state, I feel the mid-season trade period would be of little benefit to us in comparison. Samantha's a big Eagles fan. I think you touched on some really good points there. I'm against it for two reasons. The first one, like you said, um, and I didn't even think of this at first, but I believe non-Victorian clubs are somewhat opposed to a mid-season trade period because in theory, it would be so much easier for a player based in Victoria to switch clubs with another Victorian club. Whereas getting a player from you know, Perth to Melbourne or vice versa. It would be extremely rare, I think, in the mid-season trade period, given there's still footy going on and it's a huge life change to move. So I agree with that. It would create some inherent inequities, absolutely. And secondly, I kind of like the idea that clubs need to get their list sorted by the start of the season, and that's the list you stick with for that year. That's part of the strategy. That's part of the game. Trading for a bottom team's, you know, best player for, and giving up a draft pick for it mid-year and then going on to win the flag. I, I just something gross about that to me, unless it's West Coast winning the flag. Let's talk about some father-sons. This is another hot topic. So Corey says, I'm sick and tired of St Kilda diluting the draft with free agent compo. My team, Brisbane, doesn't have any free agents leaving this year. So therefore the entire system is unfair and the league is designed to favor other clubs. For anyone who missed it, this is a tongue in cheek reference to St Kilda's best and fairest. In all seriousness though, where was this father-son drama when Geelong got Gary Ablett Jr. and Collingwood got both Dacos brothers who have won BNFs? Yeah, so yeah, on the topic of father-sons in general. So as for the specific point about Gary Ablett Jr., I'm actually, you know, maybe this is showing my age, um, but I, I'm not too sure. Were there any amazing father-sons before Gary Ablett Jr.? Dustin Fletcher would have been drafted before Gary Ablett, and he's gun. Uh, was Matthew Richardson a father-son, um, you know, in the 80s and 90s? Was it that prevalent? My point being here, the father-son rule didn't really produce that many really unfair results previously. Although if you go back to the Ablett Jr. one, Geelong only had to use pick 40 to match that because of the rules at the time. So we have actually worked to make it harder for teams to match their father's sons. But at this current point in time, we've just seen an explosion of amazing father-son prospects, which is not in line with what has happened historically. Like it's just this moment in time. So is it a moment in time? What What's going on there? Why have we got two amazing Ashcrofts, two amazing Dacosses, Sam Darcy as well. Um, but who else am I missing that has been an amazing father-son in the last few years? Although it's worth noting, Josh Dacos was taken with one of the last picks of the draft, but Nick was right up there. I suppose the biggest argument against father-sons is would you have, you'd have to decide whether you think it's a systemic advantage to some teams. So it's not going to be fair, and it is against equalization. On the other hand, I do like the tradition and the father-son rule, I think is a cool part of our game. But we need to assess, is, it, is there a systemic advantage to certain teams over others? Well, you'd probably say that bigger clubs that have been around for longer have an advantage over newer teams. So Fremantle and Port Adelaide, you know, the father-son rule for them, and certainly the expansion teams, but they've got their Northern Academies. But, you know, Fremantle and Port Adelaide, who don't have the history, you know, there's no players from the 80s and 90s, or the early 90s anyway, and certainly that talent pool is smaller. They can't, in theory, produce father-sons at the same rate as the Western Bulldogs, who have massively benefited from this rule, which is not a shot. It just is what it is. Um, Libertore, Sam Darcy more recently, uh, Mitch Wallace was a handy player. Do we think that Victorian clubs have a massive advantage over every other club. Well, we're talking about Brisbane now, and Brisbane don't really have that history. So I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not completely against it now. However, one solution is to make it harder for clubs to match 
you know, bids for their father's sons. And I think that is already in the works. Samantha Jane says, I'm frankly over the father-son rule and the impact is having arguably on drafts. I'm starting to feel that these traditions are holding us back from achieving fairer, less compromised drafts, further taking into account free agency compensation and academies. It's all just getting a bit beyond the pale. Uh, yeah, I think you're right. The, the whole mix of it has created a weird landscape that we're in right now. But I wonder how far it is away where we have father-sons that aren't dominating the top of the draft. You know, there's, there's no real reason they should. I mean, there's tons of father-sons whose kids don't end up being footballers. But we are undoubtedly in a current five-year phase where father-sons are coming out the wazoo. And now I think about it, next year's got at least one with Tom McGuan going to Collingwood, probably going to be in the first round. I can't argue that it works a little bit against fairness whilst not being incredibly unfair, as long as you're making clubs pay a fair price for them. But I don't think it's our biggest obstacle or concern at the moment. Boomerstar says father-son picks need to be ramped. I'm fine with clubs getting uh, their father-son picks. However, uh, to the club that selects X player, they should get all the picks that the club matched it with. So in 2022, Will Ashcroft got selected by North at pick two. Brisbane then used picks 35, 34, 38, 40, 41 to match the bid, but then those picks just go away. I think North should get the picks or whatever team bids on father son. Same rules could apply to father uh, to academy players too. So in that instance though, North Melbourne probably go into the draft thinking we're going to take this amount of picks. So them getting 34 through 41, six picks there, um, you know, that it's probably not that handy an asset to them. It's also a little bit arbitrary which team is going to bid on them. It would suddenly then over incentivize clubs bidding on a father son and it would you know, it would benefit North Melbourne in that instance having an earlier pick, which is fine. I mean, they in this in theory, they, they, they finish low enough to have an advantage over other teams at the draft in theory, right? But it would probably be a disproportionate advantage if they're simply in the position to bid on Will Ashcroft. Oh, sweet, we just got all these draft picks. So I don't know if that's the solution personally. Let's move on now. Shadow Light says, North should trade their future first for Gold Coast pick 13 to essentially knock the Blues and Pies out of the race for Houston. Future third and fourth coming back to North as it's likely a top six pick. It's actually not a bad call. Not a bad call. That would uh, make it incredibly hard for them. I suppose the risk here is that Houston stays at Port Adelaide and North have just traded six or the top six picks next year for pick 13 this year. Um, you know, maybe that's still not the worst deal considering the strength of this year's draft or best case scenario, it gets them Houston. Brooklyn says, Dan Houston should not go to Carlton. They already have enough halfback defenders at Carlton and won't necessarily be a good fit. While AFL Snap says, Dan Houston will stay at Port Adelaide. Uh, I, I agree with you, Brooklyn, that it's an odd one for Carlton to be going so hard at. And, you know, we don't know for sure if Owies and Kennedy would stay or, or not be shopped around if Carlton weren't going for Houston, but if they are jettisoning a bunch of players that are in their immediate depth or, you know, best 22 actually to get Houston, I agree. It's a little bit hard to see why they're going so hard. It's not a clear position or need for them. As for Houston staying at Port Adelaide, I think it's distinctly possible if Carlton piss off Dan, uh, Port Adelaide in negotiations, certainly opens the door for North, but then it relies on Dan Houston saying yes to North, which may happen. And frankly, I kind of hope it does. I'm fine with him staying at Port, but it would be nice to see him go to North if he does leave. Daniel Evans says, Crows will end up getting James Peatling cheaper because GWS don't need higher end picks. And the contract for Cumming gave GW, uh, GWS a high end pick, which doesn't match the actual value of Cumming yet. I should emphasize that yes, GWS can have as many high end picks as possible, but you can only use as many picks as list spots available. Yeah, I believe Toomey's running with a future second for James Peatling. It's a little bit unclear where the Crows are gonna finish next year, in my opinion. And with the compromised nature of next year's draft, which is going to be the most compromised draft ever, that could be an awful pick. <laughs> Dwayne says, GWS won't be a good team next year because of all the players leaving. Peatland found good form as a utility towards the end of the year, coming in Perryman and versatile defenders, and Haynes and maybe Connor Stone are good depth players. It reminds me of Fremantle from 22 to 23 where they lost a lot of experience. I think it's a fair observation. I think Perryman is a pretty key player. I feel like coming up, without double checking, I think he's missed a lot lately. Like he's missed through injury. So maybe he won't be super key immediately. Um, Pete Ling was a good player this year. I think it's, you know, it's a good example to refer to Fremantle there. On the other hand, uh, first of all, GWS are probably more experienced outside of those players than Fremantle were outside of the players who left. Fremantle still one of the youngest teams at the comp, whereas GWS still have a lot of good experienced players. However, I also want to highlight the opposite example. 
Uh, I had a look at 2020 where GWS lost seven players like Jeremy Cameron, uh, Aiden Kaur, Zach Williams, and a variety of others that I'm forgetting off the top of my head. Either way, they lost. It was a, it was a huge trade period. And I had a look at their ladder position and they bounced into finals that year after missing the previous year. So I'm not sure yet. The GWS have been resilient in this space previously, but it's a fair observation to make. Gus Monfries agrees and says, GWS will decline and go down the rails unless the AFL keep pumping millions and gives them academy players like Gold Coast and Sydney. What a disgrace. How TF, how true footy does Gold Coast get Jed Walter? Yeah, that's a little bit of a side note on Walter because I think he's from Perth and grew up supporting West Coast and then lived in Queensland. I agree, the academy, the Northern Academy, it's its, it's its own thing. Once upon a time, it seemed like a great idea to invest heavily in that. Um, but specifically, the Gold Coast Academy is producing so much talent and next year they're going to have another like slew of picks. Mason Barker says, with Joe Hett Danaher's retirement, the question has to be asked of their tall forward stocks. A team with Eric Hipwood and Logan Morris as your tall forwards is a problem. We saw a similar experiment in Sydney capitulate this year with Amati and McDonald. However, I believe the team has the hybrid small forward talent to make a small forward line work. Chaos Ball has been the niche. Morris, Rayner, and the incoming McCarthy all play taller than the height. This is a good point. I, I don't I don't know how they're going to go. At the moment, you know, they're full of optimism, just won the premiership, we're never going to die, blah, blah, blah. And to be honest, they'll probably still be a good team. I'm not really concerned about them dropping off really hard, but a 203-centimeter key forward is uh, structurally something that you can't replace with an undersized Morris. And Morris is a good player, but they are distinctly different players. So they're going to be one to watch in that space. Brisbane, even though, you know, Danaher's radar could be off, he was still really important to them. So yeah, it won't be a simple fix. Leo King says the Crows are flying under the radar. I think coming in Peatling will fit right in and really help them climb next year. Yeah, possibly. Did they underachieve this year? They're still such a young team, but they're going to get Neil Bullen as well. So three players in their prime. Um, I, I, I can't wait to really deep dive their 22 and see what it might look like next year. Corey says, Gold Coast should not go after Dan Rioli. The top end of this draft is stacked and Richmond requesting at least pick six for Rioli is almost as bad as giving up pick two for Lockie Weller. Although Rioli would fit into the best 22 for round one next season, he's not a big upgrade on Lockie Weller himself, nor Will Powell. Mm, yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, giving up pick six for Dan Rioli is overpaying, really. It's just the, the nature of his contract status and the fact that Richmond have all the power in these negotiations. Um, Gold Coast, I think, are just throwing caution to the wind and saying, look, we need established players. We don't need to hit the draft. Had four first round picks last year. They have, we'll get a heap next year. I think Hardwood's saying, no, we need guys who can get us to win games now. And I think that is the correct approach, even if it means overpaying. So we'll see. I think this will benefit Richmond long term. Although I do have fears for them next year, to be honest. Dean Beasel says Eagles should let Baker go to the preseason draft. So on that one, technically it is possible, but I personally think that these days you just don't see that happen anymore. And while technically West Coast could let that happen, I think the realistic scenario here is West Coast failed to get a deal done, which I don't think will happen. But if they did, uh, I think Baker would stay at Richmond for at least another year. Um, I don't think he's the type to let his team get screwed over for nothing. So I just don't think it's a realistic option for West Coast. Fart Explosion says, Liam Dacre is a solid addition to West Coast and together with Shea Bolton, they were the shining lights in Richmond's grim short-term future. He's just not worth giving up any first round picks over though. He'll be great for a year or two before he'll decline as many players who suddenly become amazing despite rocky starts to their careers do. Is that the view on, on Liam Baker that he had a rocky start and became amazing. Am I reading that correctly? I thought Baker's been pretty consistent throughout his career, no? Played in two premierships, I want to say. Yeah, I, I agree on the first round draft pick thing. Um, you know, I don't know how this deal is going to go. When you see Don Pike interviewed, he's like, no, nah, no, nah, we're really going to hold our draft picks this year. Yet everything else we're hearing is West Coast has given up pick 14. So we'll see what happens there. Um, I've talked about this a lot on, on True Eagle. It's just, I feel like I'm going to be flat if we trade out of the top 20 of this year's draft. T. Holmes says, Adrian Dodoro's list management for the last 20 years is why the Bombers were trash. Matt Rosa having control and being ruthless with Hind delisting and Laverde Stringer not being extended is a good sign that the boys free uh, boys club free rider era is over. I suppose we'll see. I don't know. I mean, I, it's, I'd be lying if I said I followed Richmond's 20-year list management phase. Um, however, you make some good points around some decisions that they're making there, which are a little bit more hardline. I don't really know too much about Rosa as an operator. I certainly remember as a player, good footy player. And uh, I think he was, was he the CEO of Peel or president of Peel? But I don't think he's had anything to do with West Coast. So I'm not too sure. However, you're right. Essendon are uh, putting more of a hardline stance in there and maybe 
maybe under Brad Scott, he can emulate Geelong a little bit and culturally they can get a little bit closer to that. But yeah, seeing shifts in their list management strategy, Essendon have a reputation of being extremely hard to deal with. It's a new phase for Essendon and I'm, I'm intrigued to see how that's going to go. Footy card kid says Essendon need to be a part of this trade period. You can't expect a bunch of 20 under 22 players to win a final. And if the last time you won a final was 20 years ago, I wouldn't keep my list as is. They've been fairly low key, I'd say, this trade period. We've, you know, we just talked about a bunch of players that, that could leave the club. Um, and I think the only real meaningful ones are, well, there's Connor Stone, and I feel like there's been a couple more. Did they have a little bit of a dip at Dan Houston? Either way, I think they're more going for uh, Finn McGuinness is another one, underappreciated talents at other clubs and keeping their powder dry for the draft. So I think they took a really good pick last year in Nate Caddy. Um, and there's still some really good talents at that club. Given they were really active last year, getting four mature players, um, you know, maybe they just want to look at their draft position this year. So I don't know, you make a fairly good point. I don't have any strong opinions about Essendon at the moment. I suppose we'll see what happens over the trade period. And to finish up, we got some drive buys and some players that I thought would be funny. Digsby says, Haynes will be a waste of time for Carlton. He's cooked. Look, I, I, I don't want to be disrespectful to Haynes uh, because Haynes has been a great player for the Giants. Um, I suppose I would just say that I was a little surprised it's Carlton that go, uh, going for him, given where he is at his, is in his career. I thought maybe North would have a look at him. That would make more sense. Carlton obviously see him as best 22 and adding something different. So it's a bit of a punt, but a very cheap one. Um, I'm not going to say I agree he's going to be a waste of time, but I agree that he probably wasn't the first club or Carlton wasn't the first club that I thought uh, would make sense for Haynes. Music Hats King says Jack Darling's not worth it. Every time I've watched him play, he drops absolute sitters. Lucky not to have cost use the 18 premiership. I can't agree with this. So if to answer seriously on North and Darling, it would be really hard to assess what value he has there. Um, from an on-field playing point of view, I'm probably skeptical he's going to change too much. Maybe they do need the structural help there. Maybe from a leadership point of view, you know, sometimes players can get a new lease on life. He's going to be a now mentor, whereas at West Coast, he was one of many senior players. Will that revitalize him? I'm not sure. However, he also had a great career, so we can't be too disrespectful. He may have dropped the mark in the goal square in the final minutes of the 18 grand final. However, he was probably the best player on the field in the third quarter, and he's like the second best Eagle goal kicker of all time, so... I won't have it. Doyler says, didn't make it last time I said this, but Nick Dacos is just a dollar cents Jared Berry. <laughs> uh, yeah, I can't agree with that. I suppose that is a very unpopular opinion. Um, I like Jared Berry, but no. All right, guys, that has been your AFL Unpopular Opinions. Let me know in the comments what you thought of this video, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.